Bien, ya está. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, Dr. Yun, Dr. Pravin, if we are ready, then we can start. Okay. Sure. Okay, great. Um, good evening to everyone in attendance. Welcome to our College of Physicians weekly webinar. We are currently in the month of December, approaching the festive period. Um, today, our topic will be titled Re um, Fighting the Reduction in Ejection Fraction in Heart Failure and also Setting Up um, Heart Failure Services in the Rural and District Setting. With us today, we have got Dr. Yoon, our esteemed chairperson. Dr. Yoon graduated from Penang Medical College in uh, 2001 and subsequently went on to complete MRCP in the year 2005 and is currently practicing as a consultant advanced acute internal medicine physician in Hospital Pulau Pinang. So true to his uh, role as an advanced acute internal medicine physician, he wears many hats. So he takes part in um, active endoscopy in Hospital Pulau Pinang. He also is currently the head of uh, the Clinical Research Centre in Pulau Pinang, Hospital Pulau Pinang, and is also nationally the um, Deputy National Advisor for Internal Medicine Services. So with that, um, Dr. Yoon, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Eugene, for the uh, kind introduction. Um, I think first, I think I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. I think it's uh, Dr. Pravin Narayanan. I think it's giving me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Pravin. Um, he's he's our, currently our uh, fellow in acute, in acute medicine in uh, Sarawak in Kuching General Hospital. And um, for Dr. Pravin, Dr. Pravin graduated in Ames back in uh, 2011. And uh, he's a member of uh, Royal College uh, since uh, October 2016. And uh, subsequently, uh, got his uh, FRCP uh, in September uh, 2021. He's a member of Academy of Medicine. And uh, Pravin has went uh, a lot of places. I think he's worked, worked, worked in, uh, he's, he's previously the head of uh, department in uh, Hospital Sarike in Sarawak. And um, also uh, active in, uh, in uh, Academy of Medicine and also uh, Malaysian Medical Association. Um, he's also uh, involved in uh, practice writing of uh, clinical practice guidelines. I think recently he just completed uh, the clinical practice guideline on management of hepatitis B. Um, and which much, without much further ado, I'd like to uh, invite Dr. Pravin to give us a talk on uh, this very, very important subject. And also, uh, I think in keeping with our uh, team of uh, trying to um, expand services to our uh, peripheral, to, to peripheral uh, population and also peripheral communities. Um, Dr. Pravin? Thank you, Dr. Yoon. Uh, very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so, uh, welcome to the uh, weekly webinar of the College of Physicians Malaysia and it's much honour that uh, I've been given this opportunity to uh, share uh, some of my experiences in the uh, management in of, 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 of heart failure. And uh, my main focus on today's uh, presentation will actually be in the topic on fighting the reduction of EF for heart failure. However, towards the end, I have a few slides that I would like to, to just share it's more of a sharing experience rather than, I would say, uh, a mandatory practice. Because, uh, you see, in management of heart failure in a district setting or a rural hospital setting, it will totally depend on your capability of, of your services, as well as the ability of your manpower to start up such a new service. So whatever I'm going to tell you is just more of like a sharing, but uh, it depends on eventually uh, how suitable it would be for your setting to see if it can be applicable there. So without further ado, I'll just start off with my first uh, part of the presentation. So we we'll start off with the case scenario and see how we go forward from there. So this is a 39-year-old gentleman who's an active smoker. He's ADL independent, and he first presented in April 2019, referred from a GP to uh, our heart center, okay, with no known underlying comorbids. But he is a chronic alcoholic that's from further history that we managed to get, that he has a 12 years consumption of heart liquor, lung cow. So you know that in Sarawak, uh, generally, I'm not stigmatizing or saying anything, but you know, the uh, uh, type of alcohol that they consume is a little bit more different compared to uh, in others, other probably other places in Malaysia whereby the percentage of alcohol is rather high and uh, its effect of uh, uh, towards our system is probably more severe compared to other types of alcohol. So every other day is about is consuming uh, hard liquor. 
And so he presented with this non-productive cough, predominantly nocturnal for about three months. Uh, reduce effort tolerance. So remember, guys, he's presenting to a GP setting. So we reduce effort tolerance, breathlessness, abdominal distension, bipedal edema for about two months. And we noticed that his NYHA is a class three. On assessment of the cardiovascular system, there is no uh, murmurs. And on assessment of the lungs, there was bibasal fine crepitations. So in the interest of uh, patient confidentiality, of course, I did not put in the real ECGs and X-rays, but it was somewhat similar. From the ECG, we can clearly see that he has a left ventricular hypertrophy by voltage criteria over here. And if we look into the X-ray, of course, there's evidence of this is a PA erect. We can comment on cardiomegaly and, of course, congested lung fields with bi uh, bilateral pleural effusions. So we know, obviously, that this gentleman has somewhat... a uh, heart failure, decompensated heart failure. So further investigations, we've done an echocardiography. We noted that he has a global hypokinesia with a poor left ventricular function. And his ejection fraction is only 16% with all chambers dilated and some mild pulmonary hypertension. So since he is presenting to a cardiac center, of course, you know, uh, with such a low EF and the, the, the availability of coronary angiograms to be done in that setting. So it was done and it showed to be normal, these normal coronaries. Okay, because of, you know, he had uh, some uh, derangement in liver functions, they also did an ultrasound, he showed some mild cholelithiasis. So what would be the management for him? Because you see, he is coming in as referred, referred from a GP setting, rather stable patient. So obviously, his oxygenation, everything would be rather stable. So he was put on fluid restriction about 500 cc's per day and started off with diuretics, furosemide loop diuretics, and he's on a beta blocker, pisoprolol 2.5 mg OD. He started on uh, MRA, so he started on spironolactone 12.5 mg OD, and also on an ACE inhibitor, perindopril 2 mg OD, with a diagnosis of a non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy because you have a clear coronary angiogram, likely due to his alcoholism. So alcoholic cardiomyopathy is rather common in our setting in here in Sarawak in Borneo. Subsequently, this is the main issue that we face with patients. Recurrent hospitalizations due to acute decompensation. So this patient had three heart failure hospitalizations within three months. Basically, every month he comes in for one episode of acute decompensation, despite initiation of treatment. So there you go. We need to probably, then we decided probably, yes, we need to optimize his medications. Uh, some, you know, treatment may, may, may not be, you know, mandatory in... Uh, uh, or maybe taken off or something, maybe reintroduced back again. So we looked into it. Okay, frusamide 40 mg OD, we maintained that. After his acute decompensation, yeah, after offloading him, of course, upon discharge, this was what we had planned for him. Uh, we increased the dose of the spironolactone from 12.5 to 25 mg. And in view that his heart rate was about 93 in a stable state. So, of course, initiation of uh, Ivabradin, a Coralan, was, 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 was there. Okay. And perindopril was taken off and it was actually replaced with your armies, okay? And within, because you know, you already had three episodes of decompensation already. So this was the new medication that was introduced. We introduced Arni to him, Sacubitril, Valsatan, yeah? And subsequently, with repeated echoes during his follow-up, we noted that there is, obviously the LV function is still reduced. The global hypokinesia is still there, but there is a slight increment in his, Ejection fraction. Now, you see, when you assess ejection fraction, I'm sure this was already discussed in the first webinar by Dr. Abhinash on ecodynamics. On, uh, because we must always understand that echocardiography is operator dependent. However, there are a few uh, techniques of how ejection fraction can be assessed. Of course, with your modified Simpsons method, using the M mode, eyeballing technique, your take calls method. So, whatever method that we are using, uh, if you know, it is of a reliable uh, reliable hands of, of, of an echocardio uh, technician, it should be fine. So when we look here, the ejection fraction has increased from 16 to 24. However, all chambers are still dilated. And of course, because of the, uh, or because of the you know, uh, markedly reduced uh, ejection fraction, you will end up having a trivial MR also as well. So what happens is with continuous monitoring and also uh adjust adjustment of his of his medication in progression we noticed that his nyha started to improve and of course 
He was able to go back to work and he was happy. No hospitalization since then. No fluid overload, signs and symptoms of heart failure. And there was eventually, after uh, recurrent follow-ups and also optimization of medications, his ejection fraction actually did improve to about 35%, uh, although still not normal, but it was a market improvement because you must remember when he came in, his ejection fraction was only 16%. Uh, and uh, quality of life has improved from there. Okay. So we must always go back to this uh, particular table, which tells us the typical cause of heart failure, where you can understand that, you know, in the beginning stage, of course, upon diagnosis, uh, there will be an increment in your physical function when your treatment is initiated. And it plateaus to a certain a certain extent when, when you know, your physical function of the, of the heart actually, uh, and also your 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 activity, I mean, your, your daily physical function, can, it will plateau to a certain to a certain level and after that uh upon if you understand frank starling's uh, law uh, as our body tries to uh, compensate over a period of time eventually the muscles will actually give up and then there will be a drop in your 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 function your ejection fra ejection fraction eventually and you can see there is a drop in your clinical instability there will be there will, you can see that going down eventually whatever response that you are going to get from the treatment that you're giving is going to be poor and that leads to end of life so you must understand that this is a typical cause of heart failure yeah over a period of time so whatever my, i'm telling you today is actually based on my topic my talks will be actually based on the latest clinical practice guidelines of from the 2019 cpg of heart management of heart failure uh Fourth edition so i'm going to see what are the new changes that actually took place from the third CPG, which is the previous CPG, to the fourth CPG. Now, you see, uh, because I'm in acute medicine, so my, my special interest is actually also in heart acute heart failure. So the concept of classification in the new CPG has already changed where we have already, I, I will explain this in detail, on the uh, classification of the four uh, categories according to clinical presentation. So it makes it much easier compared to the previous uh, term where we use as acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Now we have already had these new four uh, terminologies. Oxygen therapy, uh, the introduction of high-flow nasal cannula, okay, has seemed to be very effective in the use of uh, heart failure. And uh, pharmacotherapy, of course, the introduction of your ARNIs, which was not there previously. And also there are uh, new sections, okay, uh, which I will also discuss uh, in special special groups. Okay, diabetes, uh, ad uh, arrhythmias, cardio oncology, uh, pregnancy, and uh, th these will be some of the topics that I will be talking to to you later as well. So, per definition, what is heart failure? So, we need to know that it is actually a clinical syndrome, uh, due to any structural or physiological. Because you see, sometimes the structural function may be all right in especially if you see in cases where you have a preserved ejection fraction, but there may be a physiological abnormality where the patient actually presents to you with symptoms of heart failure, typical symptoms. And this results in an inability to meet the metabolic demands of the body. Okay, And it is usually accompanied, but you must always remember, with signs and symptoms of systemic hypoperfusion and or volume overload. So not necessarily at all the time, you may have volume overload in heart failure. So you must remember you, you when 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 you assess that that's when I go through especially in acute heart failure on the on some of the categories that may not have a typical volume overload picture you have to be very careful in that particular group. So the typical symptoms and signs, of course, when they, when you talk about symptoms and you take the history from the patient, you're asking them about breathlessness, ankle swelling, and fatigue. And of course, upon assessment, you know that you know an elevated jugular venous pressure, especially when you're involving the right 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 ventricle. Okay, you're talking about ankle edema, and when assessment of lungs, you're talking about the you know, pulmonary basal crackles. And of course, on cardiovascular examination, you notice that the apex speed is displaced, all this from examination. So they are signs of heart failure. And of course, you know that you have a functional classification, a very good functional classification, which is already, I think, quite well known to most of us, which actually can predict your one-year mortality, which you have your NYHA class. I think I won't go into too much of details in this because I think most of us are very familiar with the uh, with the classification already. And now this is something very important, how you define or classify uh, heart failure based on the LV myocardial dysfunction. This is when you have an echo uh, done already, okay? So you this is an echocardiographic classification based on the LV 
myocardial dysfunction. So it's now the new classification, you divide it into three. Previously, it was just two, where you have reduced ejection fraction and you had the preserved ejection fraction. Now they've come up with a particular group where you have the mid-range between with, with those with ejection fraction between 41 to 49%. And of course, we say those with the preserved ejection fraction, they have an ejection fraction of more than 50%. And those with reduced ejection fraction, as we said, is less than 40%. So this is another form of classification where we go on the clinical presentation. So clinical presentation, especially the onset of the presentation can actually let us know that this patient is likely having acute heart failure or chronic heart failure. So what is acute heart failure? So rapid onset of symptoms and signs due to an acute deterioration of cardiac functions in presence or absence of a previous cardiac disease. So it can be a condition where they... Uh, may not have a uh, heart disease in prior, but they just suddenly presented with a flash uh, acute heart failure symptoms as, a, as what the symptoms that I mentioned earlier. It's a first presentation. So that can be one, one scenario. Or secondly, they probably had a previous cardiac disease which is rather stable or anything. And now they presented with a acute uh, with acute symptoms on someone who had a previous cardiac disease. So those are... Uh, uh, the rapid onset of symptoms. It's not something which they had been having for years to go and all. So this uh, puts us into a category of acute heart failure. But in chronic heart failure, this is usually a chronic state where they, as is what in the patient that we had discussed earlier, a patient that has been having stable symptoms for a, for a pretty long time. But you see, the, uh, after some period of time, they may get admitted with acute decompensation. So that is a, a, a very common that we see, you know, in chronic heart failure patients, they come, they, they get admitted, recurrent admissions for acute decompensation, probably something may tip them off. Either they are not compliant to their fluid restrictions, they over, you know, over uh, the volume overloaded, okay, or they may have some form of chest infection like pneumonia or sepsis that tip them off to develop some acute decompensation. So this is common, yeah. So diagnosis basically begins with clinical suspicion, as I mentioned earlier, a good history, as well as some, uh, and from your clinical examination, where you have picked up the signs that I mentioned earlier, such as, of course, uh, a raised JVP, uh, pedal edema, you know, by basal crepitations of the lungs, uh, displaced apex speed, and all that. Those are typical symptoms of heart failure that you should be looking for. And of course, initial investigations, very simple investigations, would be actually your ECG and chest radiograph which actually with what, what we have done for that patient earlier. And in the advent, if you have natriuretic peptides, it will be very good. But I'm sure this is not a very common investigation that is easily available in most settings. But the first two, I think, are mandatory and very basic and should be able to assist us. Of course, echocardiography is the first choice for imaging of the cardiac structure and also your intracardiac pressure estimation. If in the advent that you have access to echocardiography, that would be the best. I think in today's practice, we are all going towards point of care ultrasound where echocardiography is also one of the uh, component of your point of care ultrasound. And it will be actually very useful for you to assess actually basically the contractility we're talking about the contractility and the, and also uh, assessing the chambers and looking at the basic uh, at a, at, at a, probably looking at the valves to see to look for any you know gross abnormalities that you may you know look at so uh, point of care ultrasound would be actually very useful but if it's not available of course if you have uh, a, a, a reliable uh, echo technician who can give you a good uh, uh, view of your echo, that would be the first choice of imaging. Yeah, and of course, as I mentioned about natriuretic peptides, okay, we have this uh, uh good uh investigation that, but you must always remember that it is only to ensure to to let you know whether heart failure is possible, okay, amongst patients that cut come in with this nerve, and it's based on a cutoff value that it tells and depending on the age of the patient. Most of us are now using the anti-pro-BNP. And the anti-pro-BNP is, uh, but you must always use it with caution because there may be some conditions that can give you also an elevated anti-pro-BNP, especially if you use it in uh, patients with uh, who are pregnant and is having eclampsia, preeclampsia, it can be elevated. Uh, hypertensive emergencies, 
yes, you can get it to be, you know, when they present you with hypertensive emergencies, uh, you have to use it with caution when you want to assess the anti-pro-BNP. Uh, and of course, it will depend on the age of the patient because the cutoff values are as what I have shown here. Okay, uh, it's good to tell you that heart failure is possible, but it's not diagnostic of heart failure. You still have to go back to your signs and symptoms and also your basic investigations, as I mentioned, you know, uh, ECG, chest X-ray, and also your echocardiography. This is in situation, you, it's good to use in situations where you are probably looking at a patient who probably could be having, uh, you're not sure whether the patient is having sepsis with a heart failure ongoing, on, ongoing uh, difficult to decide from the X-ray because you have an overloaded picture, but you know, white cell counts are high and patient is having fever. So, you, you you may think that the patient is having sepsis and at the same time, they may be having heart failure. Now, in these conditions, yes, you may want to send anti-pro-BNP and if it's elevated, you, you it tells you that heart failure is possibly present in this patient also as well. I'll just give you an example of how you may be using your, your anti-pro-BNP. So in acute heart failure, they present usually with pulmonary and or peripheral edema where you have a wet or volume overload state they may have a low output state where they can present to you with shock. Usually, this happens in those patients that already they, they have a pump failure already. So the BP will be low, and you may have cold. So this is a cold, cold state, and the combination you or you may have a combination of both pulmonary edema and a low output state. So the principles of management is of course very simple. You would have to go and recognize the symptoms early, and of course identify and stabilize the life threatening hemodynamics such as your BP pulse rate oxygenation, very important, and maintaining oxygenation and perfusion to vital organs. Of course, relieving the clinical symptoms, if they are overloaded, then you have to off offload them. Okay, And mostly in acute heart failure, there is a precipitating factor that is causing the patient to go into an acute failure. So you have to identify that it could be sepsis, it could be, you know, it could be, uh, for example, uh, any stresses that uh, that could have led to an acute uh, acute heart failure at that point of time, you know, probably trauma or, you know, mostly sepsis, you know, and all those things you have to identify the precipitating factors. So this is a very important slide that I think I need to share with you all and explain in detail. The new classification of uh, acute heart failure according to the clinical presentation. So now it is divided into four and you need to be very careful which category are you dealing with when you're assessing the patient because the managements may differ between the principles of management may differ based on the category that you are dealing with. So you go to the first part which is the warm wet where you can see the perfusion is adequate. So assessment of perfusion is very important when you are seeing a patient in acute heart failure. You want to assess the perfusion state. And also, they will have an adequate perfusion. The fluid status congested. Of course, when you assess the lung fields, you see that there is a congested lung field. They may be having peripheral edemas. So in these cases, usually quite straightforward. The management, you want to offload them. You know their fluid status is congested. You start them on diuretics. And vasodilators may help, especially in use of, you know, your, your GTNs, especially when they're high BP, it helps with your offloading. And of course, in this group of patients, usually or uh, the BP would not be affected. Like you won't have a low BP or probably high BP. So inotropics may not be necessary, will not be necessary in this group of patients. So principles of management in warm wet is actually for decongestion. So that is why there's a use of, the use of diuretics is very important in this group when you identify them. Now, the second group, if you look down there, is actually the cold wet. So this is a very, very uh, dangerous group that you have to be very careful when you assess them. So perfusion status, when you assess their perfusion status, they are poor, okay? Poor perfusion. And you notice that the fluid status is congested, okay? So now in this group of patients, you have to be very careful when you manage them. You know that their fluid status is congested. And usually they will have because their perfusion is poor they would have actually there, there will be some uh, uh, low uh, blood pressure uh, or hemodynamic instability in this particular group so you may want to use uh, the advent of uh, inotropes in this in this particular group to keep the pp at a certain level of an acceptable uh, mean arterial pressure at the same time you use your diuretics to decongest them to offload them Vasodilators, be very, very careful in this particular group because, as I mentioned, the BP, uh, it can affect your BP. So you have to be very cautious if you're using vasodilators in this particular group, which it's usually, uh, it needs very close monitoring. 
Now we go into the right side where you can actually see on the top with the warm and dry. Now these are the groups of patients where you would actually have a, a perfusion that is adequate and the fluid status is not congested. So you do not use diuretics in this particular group of patients. Okay, diuretics may not be necessary. Uh, vasodilators also may not be necessary and inotropics uh, are not necessary in this group because usually their vitals, uh, their, their BP is all right. So you would not be able, you would not be needing to use uh, this uh, type of medications. This, this, uh, the principles will not include this group of medications. The most dangerous and challenging uh, part, uh, uh, sec section or the category of patients that come in with acute heart failure is the cold, dry group. And these are the group of patients that you have to be very careful when you assess them. See, their perfusion status is poor, but their fluid status is not congested. Means they do not have the typical, uh, you know, their lung fields are, are, are clear. They do not have the typical, you know, congested lung fields and they do not have uh, fetal edema, their lung bases are clear. So this group, you have to be very, very careful. Do not use diuretics in this particular group of patients. Vasodilators also, we have to be careful depending on the BP. Most of the time, they would need actually inotropic support to support the blood pressure. And you may consider fluid challenge cautiously, especially in uh, those with right ventricular uh, failure. So that that, that particular group, this, this particular cold dry group, you have to be very, very careful when you manage them. And you see the aim is actually to obtain optimal perfusion and fluid status where you get an adequate perfusion and you, you ensure that your fluid status, your lungs are not congested. You're, you're not congested. Okay, so these are the, are the basics in the classification of acute heart failure and it's based on clinical presentation. So it actually helps us in our management, especially in the ED and et cetera. So the important key points huh, when you talk about the approach to acute heart failure, you have to talk about hypoperfusion. So assessment of perfusion, very simple. Check the peripheries, feel whether they are cold you know, or warm. Capillary refill time, which is more than two seconds. Diaphoresis, patient will complain, be sweating. They reduce urine output. They may be having dizziness, confusion. And then you look at their pulse pressure. That means the difference between the, uh, the systolic and diastolic blood pressure is very, very small. So you know that they have a very narrow pulse pressure and their BP is low. So these are all signs of hypoperfusion. You have to be very careful. Okay, congestion, of course, you look for peripheral edema or top near history. They'll give you a top near, you know, an assessment of the lungs have lung crepitations, the JVP is elevated. Okay, and of course, uh, from onset, evaluate to identify correctable or reversible causes. Lah. You know, if they have any arrhythmias, you need to treat the concomitant arrhythmias, you have to treat that. Okay, or if it's, if it's due to a myocardial infarction at that point of time, you have to get to that. Okay, uh, and, uh, and assess accordingly. All right. Now, there may be factors that contribute to decompensation in patients with, let's say, they already have a stable heart failure, but why are they coming in again and again for uh, what you call uh, recurrent uh, episodes of decompensation? So look into the patient factor. Non-compliance to medications is the commonest cause of uh, decompensations. Okay, also... Uh, Dietary indiscretion, especially when you talk about salt and fluid intake, their non-compliance to their salt and fluid intake, uh, inappropriate medication usage such as uh, NSAIDs, and also alcohol consumption, a very important cause of decompensation. Yeah, and of course, if you have uh, cardiac causes, if they have superimposed the uh, myocardial ischemia or infarction, you know, or uncontrolled hypertension, arrhythmias that are not uh, settled, uh, pulmonary embolism, or you know, some valvular lesions. And of course, you think of other systemic conditions also. They, they have sepsis, superimposed infections, anemia, you know, thyroid disease, yeah, electrolyte disturbances, worsening renal disease, and of course, others such as you know, uh, urinary retention, etc. Yeah. So the drugs that are commonly used in acute heart failure, of course, uh, when they come into you in terms of in the emergency department, you have your your infusion or your IV uh, uh, furosemide or your loop diuretics, which you can use for them. Uh, in patients that you're worried that you may crash the BP too fast, you may want to consider giving them infusions. Okay, uh, if you're worried of give, that your bolus doses can can actually cause a, a crash in your BP, especially if you're worried that uh, perfusion uh, is something that you know that or that you're worried of. 
uh, especially when they have low BP and all. So yeah, you may consider using infusion rather than a bolus dose. Uh, vasodilators, you have your GTA, your nitroglycerine, uh, isosorbide dinitride uh, infusion. Nitroprusside is not very commonly used nowadays. Uh, of course, when you talk about ionotropes, of course, uh, you have your dopamine, your dopamine, norad, and adrenaline. You have. I'm sure we are all very familiar with with the usage of uh, your ionotropes. Yeah. So now we focus a little bit on your heart failure reduced ejection fraction on chronic heart failure. So this is a very busy slide, but I have summarized the slide for you to make things a little bit more easier on the flow of optimizing the approach and treatment. So in a patient that has symptoms of heart failure and you have already done an echocardiography assessment, now we are talking about uh, those with reduced ejection fraction. Yeah? Now, if the EF is less than 40, we are talking about uh, heart failure, reduced ejection fraction, but they're asymptomatic. Of course, you initiate your, your, beta, your beta blockers and also you can initiate your, your ACE inhibitors. And in their second group where if you have, uh, and you monitor them, of course, you watch for clinical response. Uh, in a patient with uh, ejection fraction uh, less than 40 and they are symptomatic, Okay, that means they already have symptoms. Now, in this group of patients, yes, you initiate diuretics if volume overload or congestion is present. And you titrate up their ACE inhibitors to a maximum tolerated dose. So you can use ARB also, it's fine, it doesn't matter. Uh, beta blockers also to a maximum tolerated dose. And of course, initiation of MRA is very important. Right? Your spironolactones are very important in this particular group of patients. And you watch for clinical response. So this is a very important uh, uh, statement that we need to make when we are actually following up patients in heart failure. Clinical response to the treatment that we are giving. What are we talking about? Clinical response here. We are talking about going back to the symptoms. So when you assess them in the clinic, what, what were the initial symptoms that they presented to you with? And you could assess them back again and ask, are they getting better? And of course, assessment of the signs. Like when you assess them, you see whether the you know the lungs, the lung bases, you're looking for the pedal edema, you know, and all that. So these are very important things when we will talk about clinical response. So if there is a clinical response, now then you aim to low to a lower maintenance dose of the diuretics. You can titrate down your diuretics and you keep the ACE and ARB at a tolerable maximum dose. You keep the beta blockers at a tolerable maximum dose, but you maintain your MRA, watch out on your potassium levels. This is the common problem we face when we initiate MRAs on patients. We do not monitor because you must remember sometimes you use ACE and your MRAs, you can affect your potassium levels. Patients sometimes they tend to have a bit of hyperkalemia, so you have to maintain that. So you watch on your potassium levels. If there is still no clinical response, then of course there is an idea of switching your ACE or ARBs to your RNEs. Okay, you can switch them to your to your uh, sacubitril valsartan. And if you notice that the heart rate is persistently more than 70, but they're still in sinus, still in sinus rhythm, huh? there is a role of adding Ivabradin for Alan to them, okay, to control the heart rate so that it doesn't stress too much on, on, on the heart. You may or may not want to add digoxin if, if it's still not, you know, the heart rate. This may need to control your heart rate. And of course, eventually you want to assess your clinical response thereafter. Now, the use of Eva Bradin has actually been uh, shown in the SHIFT study. I think if you're interested to go and check on that, what it has shown that it has significantly reduced uh, the composite endpoint of hospitalization, worsening of heart failure symptoms and cardiovascular death by about 18%. Okay, what it does is actually it reduces your heart rate. So it reduces the burden of your uh, of, of, of your of the pump. So Ivabradin, though indicated for only chronic heart failure patients who are clinically stable, they are not indicated in acute heart failure. So you may not want to start them in acute setting because you must always remember uh, in acute uh, heart failure, you, you allow the uh, heart rate to be enhanced a little bit to, to uh, which will represent your cardiac reserve. So using uh, trying to bring down the heart rate too soon in acute heart failure will not be beneficial because it can make them it can uh, you can, you are losing you will end up losing your cardiac reserve in this in this uh, situation. So you be very careful. That is why also use of beta blockers is very very uh, controversial in this particular group also as well because you allow a little bit of uh, enhanced heart rate to 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 keep the cardiac reserve. So be very careful. Eh? Do not use this medication in acute heart failure. But you start them when they come to your clinic. You know, when they're very stable, uh, they're not having acute symptoms at that time, yeah, then you can start that to control your heart rate. Yeah? 
ultimately if there is no clinical response okay if you are sitting in a in a medical outpatient department or in a district hospital then yes now it is a uh, time for referral to a tertiary cardiac center and then they may consider if the bp is still low or they may consider some short term parenteral inotropic support the use of in uh, what in uh, implantable cardiac defibrillators or your cardiac uh, synchronization therapy may be useful in this particular group of patients so we talk about implantable cardiac defibrillators there are certain indications that we may want to to look at before we actually refer to a tertiary cardiac center so we want to see the indication of using is it for a secondary prevention or is it for a primary prevention but you must always remember icds do not improve your ef okay it do not it doesn't improve your ef what it does is that it prevents the patient from developing a sudden cardiac death now this is the uh, uh, the role of your your ICDs in in this group of patients. It doesn't it doesn't improve your EF. So even if you put that uh, ICD, uh, what what is what is going to happen is that it's not going to not not three months later when you repeat your echo you're going to show an improvement in EF. No, it doesn't. It just prevents the patient from getting a sudden cardiac death because of their of their of their cardiomyopathy. So you must remember in primary prevention where you prophylactically put that in, you, you the role is, of course, as I mentioned, like to reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. And it can be considered in patients that have uh, prior MI and at least 40 days after an MI and three months after vascularization by PCI or CABG with EF less than 30%, no heart failure symptoms. Or if the EF is less than 35% with mild to moderate heart failure symptoms, you're looking at the NYHA class 2 to 3 lah. But even a non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and their EF is less than 35%, if they are mild to moderate heart failure symptoms, you do about 2 to 3, NYHA 2 to 3. And heart failure symptoms is, uh, no heart failure symptoms, NYHA class 1. So this is in primary prevention, means before they uh, develop any arrhythmias or any, uh, you know, uh, like a uh, sustained VTVF or anything that, you know, before they develop such uh, arrhythmia, to prevent them from going into such a risk, you can put that in those with very low EF, with low EF, okay? Now, in secondary prevention is in those patients that probably already has been resuscitated from a, a, a life-threatening arrhythmia, especially in those who have developed a ventricular fibrillation or a, a unstable sustained ventricular tachycardia. So these survivors uh, have very high risk of recurrent events. So then you can put that for them to prevent them from dying from a, a, a second attack. And in uh, those patients who are at high risk, such those with chronic heart failure and EF less than 35, who have experienced a syncope of unclear origin. Uh, so these are very high risk group of patients. So you may want to consider uh, an implantation of ICD for them. Or those with uh, prior MI and uh, EF less than 40%, with non-sustained VT and inducible sustained VT or VF during a EP study. So during an electrophysiological study, you can they have they have induced a sustained VT or VF. Okay. And this group of patients with, with a prior MI and EF less than 40. So this group of patients are also very high risk of developing a sudden cardiac death. And we we consider them for ICD under secondary prevention. Okay. So now we talk about the special groups. Uh I have uh briefly uh, prepared for five groups here we talk about diabetes because it's a common situation where you will actually have heart failure with diabetes the manage in the same manner as a patient without diabetes actually there's no difference in uh, the management of heart failure be it whether they have diabetes or no diabetes just that it has shown that you know the use of sglt2 inhibitors has shown to reduce cv mortality and heart failure hospitalizations lah. And your GLP-1 agonists, your saxagliptin and your DPP-4 inhibitor are best avoided because a trend, there's more towards a trend towards harm in this, especially in your GLP-1 agonists. If you have uh, such patients who are already on that and they develop heart failure, I would, the advice is not to con consider this. But SGLT-2 inhibitors, yes, it has shown to reduce CV mortality. Uh, generally, your sulfonylureas, your metformins and all are, are generally safe like, in the use of uh, heart failure in diabetes. In pregnancy, now this is a very important group that we need to focus on because you would end up actually uh, counselling a lot of patients in this particular uh, group of uh, uh, sorry, yeah, something on my line there. Okay, 
So, yeah, in this particular group of patients, you would actually uh, be very, very careful because you must understand that uh, heart failure in, uh, in pregnancy it should be managed by a multidisciplinary team consisting of physicians, obstetricians, and pediatricians. So it has to, you have to look into the EF. And if the EF is less than 30, and in those with NOHA class 3 and 4, they should be strongly advised to not get pregnant. So uh, usually we re refer them to a pre-pregnancy clinic where they will be actually assessed by the uh, obstetricians. And we will look into contraceptive methods to tell them that, you know, they should not be, you know, uh, should not get pregnant because of the uh, the effect of their heart failure will not be able to, you know, uh, go through the pregnancy based on a very low EF that they and their functional status are not uh, advisable for them to go. And if they get pregnant, termination should be considered. These are recommendations from our CPG. And heart failure that develops during pregnancy, if they or if they develop heart failure during the pregnancy, then of course you can manage them with medications judiciously. Lah, okay. Arrhythmia induced heart failure, especially in those with uh, with underlying uh, arrhythmia, I mean, some form of arrhythmias, and it has induced cardiomyopathy. So you need to treat it either with drug therapy or catheter ablation therapy, okay, to to get the arrhythmia off to assist in your in the treatment of your of your heart failure and then of course if they have symptoms you decongest them and all but the underlying cause the arrhythmias uh, needs to be uh, assessed accordingly and treated accordingly now this is a very uh, tricky group where they have cardio oncology related uh, heart failure reduced ejection fraction because you know that there are certain uh, medications uh, chemotherapy chemotherapeutic medications uh, that may cause uh, cardiomyopathy but it's not common so uh, a close collaboration between the oncologists and cardiologists are important, you know, and they should actually assess the uh, the CV risk factors. It should be explained to the patient that, you know, if there if there is a risk of these particular medications that, you know, that can cause the risk versus benefits need to be dis discussed with the patient to see. And they understand that, you know, there may be some side effects as such that can happen, you know, before initiation of the treatment. And of course, uh, in chronic kidney disease, it's a very challenging uh, condition for us and very complex condition for us to, to manage where you have cardiac and kidney disease, which is commonly coexist, you know. And of course, the use of diuretics, when you use intravenous diuretics to decongest, you have to be very, very careful that sometimes you may deplete the volume status and it can cause a worsening of a pre-renal acute kidney injury, especially in patients who have already underlying chronic kidney disease. So the, the, the usage of diuretics, especially intravenous diuretics, has to be with with, with caution. And of course, when you when you when you uh, manage them, uh, let's say if the patient is undergoing some form of hemodialysis and everything, the amount of extraction that you are going to be uh, doing for the patient and everything it has to depend on uh, the volume status at that point of time because over extraction can be harmful to the patient so you have to be very careful when you are assessing that you know especially in chronic kidney disease patients in advanced or refractory heart failure patients or recalcitrant heart failure patients severe symptoms of heart failure despite maximum medical therapy you have done maximum medical therapy symptoms are still severe Hospital admission may be necessary for stabilization. And you must remember, fluid balance has to be very, very meticulous in this particular group. They may need a special treatment in a CCU or ICU where you may need to undergo intravenous infusion of lucemides because you understand the BP may not be very, uh, very, uh, or may not be high or normal because they already have a pump failure already, refractory heart failure. So you have to be very careful when you're giving uh, intravenous, when you're giving infusion of uh, of, of your diuretic. So in, in, intravenous infusion would be the choice rather than bolus losses because it can actually crash the PP further. So you have to be very careful. And do you have to add on some inotropic, very low dose inotropics to keep the PP at a sustainable level. So uh, these are the, the strategies that you may use when you are managing this particular group of patients. Monitoring and follow-up, as I mentioned. Those with heart failure, they require regular follow-ups and monitoring. So serial evaluations. So what are you going to do when you are seeing the patient back in the clinic? Number one, you have to assess the patient's response to therapy. And are they developing any complications or is the disease progressing? These are the three very important things when you do when you see the patient during your follow-up. So the first thing, when you see the patient, uh, when you're talking about symptoms, uh, 
you have to go back to when was the recent episode of decompensation or clinical instability. And then you see the when you are seeing the patient now, you look at the time frame that you are seeing the patient. So that is the time that you are seeing that the patient has developed some form of a clinical stability. Then you look into whether you want to adjust the pharm you want to optimize the pharmacotherapy there. That is the best time. Not after just immediately after they develop a decompensation. That is not the time that you want to make a drastic change in their pharmacotherapy or optimization of their pharmacotherapy. It's when you actually see them when they are developed a clinical stability and they're seeing you in the clinic. That is actually the best time when we sort of adjust their 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 treatment. So when so there will be certain times where you may want to refer them to a cardiologist. When are we going to refer them? Now, usually heart failure with stable symptoms, they usually manage in a primary care setting at a primary care level. A referral to be cardiologist uh, can be only considered, usually considered in the following situations. When you have a de novo heart failure that needs a comprehensive workup, for example, you have extensively investigated for the cause of heart failure in this patient, but you're still unable to determine the etiology. In the rare conditions where uh, you look for infiltrative diseases, like I've seen a few, like sarcoidosis, uh, cardiac amyloidosis. So they, these patients may need uh, some form of uh, uh, advanced imaging, like cardiac MRI and all that. Yes, you may want to refer them to a, a cardiologist for further assessment. When their episodes of acute de decompensation are too frequent in a particular short period of time, then you may want to see whether do they need, and especially if your center does not have the advent of uh, looking for ischemic uh, or coronary vas uh, coronary artery disease. I mean, you, you suspect that they have uh, a very bad coronary artery disease and they probably will need some form of intervention in that way. Yes, then you may want to refer them to a cardiologist. Worsening heart failure symptoms despite appropriate therapy means you have gone through, you have, you have done all what you can, yet the patient's heart failure symptoms is worsening. It's not improving. So there you have something that's not that 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 probably needs uh, further investigation. You want to refer them to a cardiac center. Uh, when they start developing excessive bradycardia and symptomatic hypotension with your pharmacotherapy, because you must always remember the medications that you're going to give the patient is actually going to be reducing their heart rate. Now they're developing excessive bradycardia already. So and they're developing hypotension. So and you know that there is a the uh, uh, what you call up titration of medication during clinical stability time is going to be very difficult for you. Now you're talking about a patient that is coming to you to the clinic, but you know when you assess their vitals and all, you see that the PP is low. Patient is so complaining, it's not have a bit of giddiness and all. And you know that uh, you cannot up titrate their medication at this point of time. Okay, yes, then of course uh, an indication to that will be an indication for a cardiology referral to see if. Uh, you know, further assessment can be done for the patient. Of course, if they have Asen Wenger syndrome, that is another indication for a cardiology referral. Yeah. What would when would you consider palliation? Okay. Now, palliative for end of life care is uh when you know that despite guideline directed medical therapy, they are still not improving. Uh, and you have done you have investigated thoroughly. Still, you you see that the patient uh there is nothing much that can be done from here. And there is a progressive functional decline, be it mental or physical state in the activities of daily living. Yes, this group of patients, you may want to consider uh, palliative or, or end of life the treatment. Yeah, And of course, uh, when the symptoms are very severe with poor quality of life, uh, despite optimal pharmacological and non-pharmacological therapies, then this is another group uh, that you may want to consider referral to palliative care for further management. Huh? Now, this is the last few slides that I have, uh, just my sharing on the establishment of the heart failure clinical uh, services that we that I had when uh, during my, my practice in uh, as a physician in one of the rural hospitals in Sarawak. Uh, Hospital Sarike, which is about 600 kilometers, uh, sorry, about 400 kilometers away from Kuching. And see, this was the issues that we faced in our setting. We had patients who came in with recurrent admissions for decompensated heart failure. I used to see the patients coming in every two weeks. And what they get is just temporary relief and there's no short-term follow-up to see their progress. And of course, 
they this caused a very uh, rapid increase in the use of non-invasive ventilation of course when they come in and NIVs are to are unknown to be actually very useful in especially in decongestion of uh, of, of those patients that come in with decompensated heart failure although it's just short term only now risk factor control as i mentioned in our case that we first saw a lot of them have uh, a lot of uh, strong risk factors that can that, that cause them to decompensate uh, and of course when we see them upon discharge you know our our follow up dates uh, you know, you can't give them a very short follow-up date because the clinic congestion is just too heavy in your medical outpatient clinics. Then you talk about compliance of diet control, fluid control, and medication dosage. Very difficult to be done during the admission. And by the time you see them next, it's already about three months later. In the three months, what happens? They keep coming again and again and again for, for, for admissions, you know. There was no dedicated approach to follow up to the progression of the symptoms. And what I'm seeing here, talking about, is the clinical response to your treatment. So this is the very important uh, aspect that I look into when I'm assessing a patient that comes back for recurrent uh, admissions of decompensated heart failure. From the previous admission to now, what is it that has been causing the patient to come back again and again and again, despite the adequate treatment that I'm giving the patient? So there is no, you see, there is no uh, approach to follow up that progression, you know. So that is why we decided to form a dedicated team approach, which comprises of physician, medical officer, uh, M-Tech pharmacist, echo MA, nurse, and dietitian. We just started off with very small numbers, about five patients per clinic session. We used to run it on a Friday afternoon. And then slowly, we increased the numbers over a period of four to six months. In, this would depend on the team's strength and capability. Of course, prior to initiation of this uh, this team, we had undergone a form of training in uh, Pusat Jantung Sarawak under a dedicated uh, uh, consultant cardiologist who has a special interest in heart failure. So we were we were given a plan on how to approach our how to start up the clinic, and of course this this is an example of what we would actually uh, assess when the patient comes to us. Uh, we'll be looking at the weight, the BP, pulse rate, the NYHA, the EF. Uh, when the patient, what is the EF when you start off with? And of course, we do. Uh, uh, we had the advent of, of of running the anti pro BNP on the first on, on during the during the, the the clinic visit, and then we look into the 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 comorbids that the patient has as uh, and the etiology whether it's ischemic or non ischemic because of course etiology is very important. If you, there's an underlying cause like for example thyrotoxicosis or or anything for the matter, you need to tackle that that etiology if it's non ischemic. Okay, ischemic of course. Uh, you know, what intervention has been done for the patient. So symptoms of overload. So we always assess the dyspnea, autopnea, they're having paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea or any peripheral edemas. Compliance, a very important section in our clinic follow-ups. Are they compliant to their diet? The diet Because we have a dietitian, you'll be talking to them and everything. And uh, fluid restriction, medications, this part will be assessed by my pharmacist. Are they missing doses? So pill count, uh, pill box, uh, and all this uh, form of... Uh, uh, assessment will be done by my dedicated pharmacist at that point of time. And every time they come, we have to actually assess by doing an ECG. You want to look at whether they're in AF or any arrhythmias that they have. Blood investigations. Of course, you have to look at the potassium. You look at the liver function also as well to look and see if there's any decongestion. Uh, sorry, any conge liver congestion over there. What medications are they on? And any other remarks that you'd like to make. So these are just a basic template of uh, when I start up my clinic, the, the important information, and it's filed into every patient's uh, notes when they come to the clinic. And beginning in January 2021, we started up the heart failure clinic services in Sarike. And we had our own heart failure. So we, on the left-hand side, you can see a dedicated pharmacist actually will be going through uh, the medications and uh, checking on the compliance. And then we have our medical officer assessing the patient's symptoms, signs, and... Uh, seeing what, what can be done to improvise uh, and all that. So this is from our Sarawak Heart Centre. And I think uh, that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much. I give it back to Dr. Yoon. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Pravin. Yeah, I think, I think thank you so much for covering uh, uh, this this uh, very common uh, uh, topic that we that, that we have i think th this is a significant burden and uh, for in terms of uh, resources i think because these these patients they they always come in at a recurrent re recurrent and then the quality of life is no good if it's not optimally um treated okay um i think eugene now now we can go to q q a 
uh, okay, there's one question. What happened is that, uh, what is special in diastolic heart failure? How to treat? So there are two questions actually inside this one. So uh, what is special in diastolic heart failure and how to treat and assess? Okay. Uh, the thing about diastolic heart failure is uh, it's actually a, a to pick it up itself, you may need a special form of assessment from your echocardiography where there is a measurement of your EA ratio, which it indicates at a certain level what is the cutoff point, which tells you that the patient is having a, a, a diastolic heart failure. But in terms of treatment and approach, it is still the same as any, you know, even if they present to you as a systolic heart failure or, or you know, a reduced ejection fraction heart failure of any way, the, the approach and the treatment is similar. There is no change in how you approach them. And in terms of in terms of treatment wise also, the medications, there's no difference. But you suspect diastolic heart failure when the patient, for example, has got a good EF. Okay, it's got a good EF, but they have typical symptoms of heart failure. And this is the time where you would actually ask your echo tech, can you measure the EA ratio for me to see probably, you know, in preserved EF heart failure, whether there is a diastolic dysfunction that is taking place here or not. So it is just, to, it's good to, to pick it up. But in terms of treatment and management, it's still the same. There is no difference between the management of both. Um, yeah, maybe just to add to that, I think uh, diastolic uh, diastolic heart failure is actually quite common. Actually, if yep. I am not mistaken, I think it is actually fifty fifty. Uh, actually, mm -hmm. because in terms of systolic and diastolic heart failure, right. uh, whether uh, 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 and it's frequently missed. Uh, so what happens is that right. typical symptoms of uh, of uh, of heart failure, but the EF is is good. Sometimes we we, we keep forgetting that uh, that uh, that uh, heart failure EF good means no heart failure. That, that's I think the main main takeaway message. Uh. Mm. Um, it, it's diastolic heart failure is because of the uh, uh the, usually it's because of relaxation because because remember that uh, that that when it, it, the heart feels doing diastole, so 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 if the heart don't feel properly, so either because usually because of stiffness of the ventricles. Uh. So right. um, personally, what I usually do is actually uh, I think like like what Dr. Ray mentioned, I think uh, diuretics uh, they're just similar to the systolic heart failure. And um, sometimes I think uh, beta blockers because because uh, 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 when it's a stiff ventricle, sometimes uh, uh, we slow down the heart rate. Uh, it feels right. give it a bit more time to fill. So 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 that 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 that. But other than that, I think it's pretty much the, the, the pretty much the same. Yeah. But remember to 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 think about it, lah. Uh, suppose correct. Um, Dr. Pravin, is it okay we go to the next question? Sure. I think we have another question here from okay from Arjun Kumar. So okay. Uh, any benefits of cardiac resynchronization re therapy by Van pacemaker? As I mentioned, all your 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 ICDs and your cardiac resynchronization re therapy, they are mainly they, they are actually not to uh, so called improvise your EF, probably to prevent them from going into a sudden cardiac death, which is actually something that is very very uh, worrying in those patients with low EF. So you have to be very very careful in this. In this group of patients, the benefits is actually more of of to prevent SEDs. I don't know, Dr. in your practice, do you do you think that uh, it, it does improve in your in 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 terms of your uh, uh what do you call symptomology and all that? Because those patients that I I know that they, that they go through this is actually to you know to prevent them from going into uh, SEDs rather than uh, you know improving their EF or their symptoms. Uh, yeah, I think it depends on the type of device actually because mm. uh, they ask there's, there's, there's the uh, resynchronization, which means that they, they're trying to resynchronize the uh, atrium and also the ventricle. So I think basically the atrial kick, uh, those, 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 those days that we used to study back, back in, uh, 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 in, in uh, undergrad where, where there's the atrium, the, the, the atrium, uh, so atrial kick about 30%, I think, so contributes about, about 30%. But if it's big patient, we good. Um, uh, EF, so even patients with AF, uh, they, 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 they're still, still pretty okay. But suppose that if the heart failure is so bad that, that, that sometimes they, they require that. Nah. But um, having said that, I think, I think cardiac resynchronization cannot be used on, in AF patients. I mean, they yep. can just be in sinus. Mm. Um, and then another thing is actually because sometimes these machines come with, uh, 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 together with the, uh, the, what do you call that, defibrillators inside, inside right. one shot. Because sometimes if anything happens, then, then they try to terminate that, that, that off. Right. Yeah. So it depends on device, but but these right. are usually important actually because uh, 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 by this time uh, you should mm. number one this thing costs a lot of money. This will be a pure purely cardiologist uh, opinion. There, but benefit right. um, not not uh, 
like 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 Dr. Brian mentioned actually because benefit uh uh, uh sometimes uh dif difficult because you have to choose the candidate properly because by the time you need the device the heart failure is pretty bad pretty bad yeah pretty bad so 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 that's the the, the thing hmm. I think okay. yeah we in, in I think in in adverse of time I think uh, yeah let's move on to the next question yeah I think uh, okay we we have one more i think we just take one more question now okay sure yeah so one question here uh your thoughts on simultaneous administration of ivf intravenous fluids okay okay with diuretics to maintain intravascular volume to prevent aki or to halt worsening of aki okay that so that so you must remember uh assessment okay now in the advent of point of care ultrasound uh you know that uh assessment of your ivc is uh equivalent to CVP monitoring, okay? But you have to take into consideration uh, the group of patients that you're going to assess. Uh, not everybody would have the similar, you know, size of your IVC and all. But of course, IVC is a good assessment uh, tool to, to see. So when you notice that the patient is, especially in a group where they are in acute heart failure, when they are actually, the perfusion is poor, okay? And they are actually congested. Uh, this is a very dangerous group, you know. So perfusion poor and they are congested. So you have to assess, you have to do real-time assessment of your uh, volume status. And one of a good way of real-time volume, we don't use put in CVPs anymore already now. So assessment of your IVC. If you see an IVC distended at that point of view, you have to be very careful when you are scanning. Uh, you're not going and scanning the iota and seeing if it's distended and saying, oh, patient distended. So when you are scanning the vessel, make sure you put a Doppler wave to see whether you are actually really seeing the vein or you're seeing the artery. So if you're seeing the vein, you know you're sitting at actually the IVC and assessing. If, if you see a systolic diastolic flow, you know you're sitting, you're, you're, you're looking at the iota there. Very careful. So you have to see the IV, and you see IVC, which is just a single uh, flow, then you know that, okay, you assess the size of your IVC uh, during, uh, or you assess the size of the IVC if it is small or it is, uh, you know, uh, reduced, then you know that there are some space for, you know, some form of fluids that can be given to to uh, to to maintain the intravascular volume, because very important in this. If you if they if you tip them into a, a pre renal AKI, eh, it it just it's a whole cascade of of a dominoes effect where the patient will just deteriorate and totally just go down hill. Then it's very difficult. Then you have to start, you have, you have to refer to nephrology to get some form of uh, renal replacement, acute renal replacement. It's going to be very uh, big of a problem. So if you can identify early that the volume is depleted, you can give some small fluid challenges to maintain the intravascular volume. Okay. But also be very cautious of the uh, our overall volume status of the patient. Okay, are they very very congested at that point of time? If not, you have to be very careful. You don't you don't give uh too much fluids. You know, even though you can see, even though the intravascular volume is depleted, you have to be very careful. So you give and then you reassess back again. So that is why frequent assessment of patients very important in this difficult group of acute heart failure when you manage them. So you have to be there with the patient. You have to you have to, you have to sit and manage them. You know, accordingly there. Yeah, I hope that answers the question, and I think don't think there are any more other questions. Doctor, you anything you want to add on? Um, yeah, just to add on actually because the, I think like what 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 uh Doctor Parvin mentioned, I think because a lot of times these patients are very delicate. I think the fluid fluid balance, like getting it just right, is not going to be very difficult. So it's right. going to be like the Goldilocks zone, nah? not too hot, not too cold, that situation, mm -hmm. and not too overloaded, not too. Uh, so so a lot of times happen that it requires a, a recurrent, I mean repeated assessments because this this situation is dynamic. Nah? So, so I think that, that and, and, and one thing very good is actually point of care ultrasound allows you a tool to do that. One is the IVC and so you can actually look at the LV, LV, LV uh, function dynamically uh, actually because, because how, how does it deal, actually deal with the, with the, with the, with, with, with the, the fluids. So, right. um, that, that, that's the, 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 the situation because what happens is that uh, once we get into AKI, AKI uh, then, then it's going to be another big, 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 big problem. So, so because, because they end up with dialysis and that situation. Uh, Right. So, so, but um, having said that, uh, these are difficult patients. Th th these right. are going to be delicate just to get it right. As the balancing on, the, not balancing on 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 a seesaw. And it's more than one factor. It's like elephant balance on a ball. So it's multiple factors. A bit going to be very delicate. Right. Okay. Thank you, yeah. Doctor Yoon. Thank you. Yeah, I'm thinking in the any more uh, questions. I think I think yeah. Yeah, okay. because I think in the interest of time, that that's the, mm, um, the time, yeah. Yeah, I think maybe I'll pass it back to the host, Eugene. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Yoon. Thank you, Dr. Pravin, um, for the 
talk, I believe uh, this topic is very common. We see it on a daily basis and the questions were also very lovely because questions were mainly, you know, questions that we face and we see on the ground every single day. Um, so thank you so much once again, Dr. Yoon and Dr. Pravin for your time. Thanks everyone in attendance. Uh, we'll see everyone next week for our final session before we wrap up the year. So have a good evening, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Afik. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr.